Uh, Liz is going to be talking about uh, a variety of things and then uh, be available to take questions at the end as well. And then the third panelist is uh, my friend and, and colleague, Damian Cox. And uh, Damian is uh, of the, he's got a, it's a very creative name for his law firm. It's the, uh, the Cox Law Firm, I think. Is that what it is? Yeah, that's, that's it, yeah. All right, good. Uh, he keeps it simple, but uh, Damian, uh, I'm sure most of you that are participating here today uh, know him or are familiar with him. Uh, he has, uh, just not to, not to say too many nice things about him, but uh, he, uh, he's been uh, an, an indispensable piece of our real estate industry going back for a number of years. And, uh, and just on, on a personal level, uh, has been incredibly helpful to, to, to me, and I hope it's been reciprocal, but as we've been uh, working through the last uh, month or so of, of all the curveballs getting thrown at uh, all of us in the industry, uh, he's been a real critical, real critical piece of, of uh, uh, some of the stuff that Carr's been, been doing and, and has been a, a big help to me, and, and like I say, hopefully it's reciprocal. But, uh, and then you'll also see at the top that uh, uh, Lisa Hansmeyer, who's our Vice President of Member Services, is kind of running things on the back end. I know Jonathan Griggs, who's our Director of uh, IT and Operations and the, the car world, uh, is up there and running things on the back end. And then Holly Krell uh, as well, and she's our, uh, our Manager of uh, Professional Development. So hopefully that's some of what we'll do, we're doing here today. I promised Holly that we'd get some, some actual professional development in here. Uh, and so hopefully that's what we get to. So um, anyhow, I'm going to, uh, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to spend, uh, pop up a PowerPoint here, I hope, and, uh, and we are going to dive into, um, uh, a, uh, a bit of um, a review of some things kind of going on. And I'm assuming that's what everybody sees. Or are you still just looking at me? I'm looking at you. All right. Screen sharing has failed to start. Please try again later. <laughs> there How's it is. that? Here we go. Is that back up? All right. Um, there we go. All right. So uh, what we're going to do here today is uh, I'm going to, Dave and I are going to kind of go back and forth on a couple of issues on this first slide. And then Liz is going to give an update on a variety of things that are happening at the state legislature. Uh, some, uh, to the extent that we have them, some update on the CARES Act and some of the, a lot of questions we've been getting with regard to uh, the, the ability to, for independent contractors to submit for unemployment uh, and, and some of those issues. And, uh, and then we're going to do a, a Q&A. So as you guys are typing questions at the end or it, throughout the thing, I'll just, I'll just go through from the top and kind of knock them, knock them out going down. And hopefully we can accomplish all of that over the course of the uh, of next hour, hour and a half or so. So anyhow, uh, first thing, I'm going to toss it to Damien and, uh, and Damien's going to talk about the addendum. Uh, you know, the addendum has been circulated. I think we're now on week number two. It was approved, I think, two weeks ago today. If I'm, if I remember correctly, it's all been kind of a blur. But uh, Damien's gonna gonna touch on a little bit on the addendum and uh, and and uh, some some teaching points with regard to kind of when and how to utilize it and so forth. And I'll just say before we get started, as I was mentioning before, uh, some of the ways that Damien's been incredibly helpful. The vast majority of the language out of the addendum really came out of uh, out of out of Damien's uh, mouth, I guess is the way to say it. But uh, He's also the vice chair of the forms committee for the uh, real estate commission. Um, and so he does a lot of, a lot of forms drafting uh, in the real estate commission approved forms that you are all are so used to, uh, to working through and uh, just has been incredibly helpful with that as well. So Danny, I'll turn it over to you and, and let you chat a little bit about the addendum and some thoughts that you might have there. All right. Well, thank you. So um, the addendum, obviously you guys have had for a couple of weeks, as Scott said, the, importance of it was that what was going on in our industry with COVID-19 was that we had a whole bunch of brokers out there uh, that were either using their own language or finding stuff from other states or using addendums from other states. And it just became a free for all of people trying to find solutions to a problem that we didn't know how to solve. So Scott was trying to find solutions. And when we found out that the real estate commission couldn't act quick enough, 
uh, suggested, you know, maybe it's time that we go to the Bar Association and ask them about getting a form that uh, was part of the legislation that, that Liz and Scott helped push through uh, years ago with standard forms in which the bar could create forms for use by brokers. And um, because of that collaboration back then, the Bar Association was able to actually work on putting together that form. So the COVID-19 addendum that you guys have seen circulated through CAR, I think it's up on CTM, IRIS, um, Real Estate Commission's website, uh, pretty much anywhere and everywhere, uh, was a collaboration there with the Bar Association to try and make it available for brokers. Um, the form, I will tell you, has its limitations. Um, we're in a world that is very fluid, that is evolving every day and there's something new that comes into place. Um, I've had clients ask, should we be using it in every single transaction? Is it something we should use when we have problems? I will tell you, in my opinion, the best thing about this form is to at least discuss it at the beginning and have that conversation with people up front about, you know, what is, um, what are we going to need? What, what issues are we going to run into? Are we going to have problems with lenders? Are we going to have problems with title companies? Are we going to have problems with clerk and recorders or treasurers or all sorts of different things? And make sure that you guys are communicating with the other side as far as whether or not this is appropriate or not appropriate. The, the issue has been lately is that the form, like I said, was created at a time when we didn't have a statewide shelter in place or statewide stay at home order from the executive branch. So one of the limitations with the form right now is the fact that box two has in there that, hey, if, if the parties are under a quarantine, whether it's mandatory quarantine, voluntary quarantine, or a stay at home order, um, that either party can give notice and have a delay, which incidentally means that if you check that box, either party can delay your transaction automatically. So, so again, you want to talk about whether, what, are the, what are we trying to accomplish and whether it's appropriate for your specific transaction. Um, I still think like Scott, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. You and I talked so much about this form that, uh, I'm sure I'm leaving some stuff out, but, but to me, the first box is still very applicable because you still have these limitations of entities. Um, second box, you guys are going to have to decide if you want to allow one party to just automatically have a, have a stay. Um, one of the, some of the limitations I have seen so far that I just want to point out is, uh, lenders are running at lesser capacity, so they're having a harder time getting loans approved. Uh, title companies are running at lesser capacity, so they're having more difficult getting out their title commitments. Um, treasurer's offices are not able to get out the tax certificates that are due with the record title deadline, so it's something that you may need to extend both those deadlines to give them time to get those out in your transactions. Clerk and recorders at one point has shut down which made it so that people couldn't record documents, which had its own host of problems. Um, so there's a lot of different moving parts here. I think box one still works fairly well, but again, it's about the parties negotiating whether or not it's appropriate for that transaction. Yeah, I, I would agree with, with everything Damien said. I, the, the, the one thing that I would say on the, on the second box, I, I do think it is appropriate. There is a line in there uh, that does require one party to give notice to the other. And so just because you implement the addendum and check that the box number two doesn't necessarily because of the shelter in place or stay at home uh, orders that may be going on at the state or even at more restrictive levels at, 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 uh, at the county uh, or city level, uh, it doesn't mean that that automatically uh, extension gets invoked. It still does require notice. And you can see the next topic slide that we're going to talk a little bit about is good faith. And I think that there's an element of that to it. I mean, if, if both a buyer and a seller are sort of marching in lockstep and both are interested in, in moving towards closing and uh, the, you know, to my mind, if, if, if there isn't a, because of the exemptions for real estate transaction, if there isn't uh, a specific uh, situation where somebody is uh, either suspects they have the illness or uh, actually has the illness, then, then, you know, the, the shelter piece of things is something that the parties are going to really have to analyze, uh, you know, internally from a good, I mean, like so many areas in the contract, there's opportunities for a party who maybe isn't uh, perfectly well intentioned with regard to uh, how they want to react or exercise a contingency. Uh, this would be kind of very similar. As Damien mentioned, I do think that that first paragraph is pretty important to implement because, you know, that really is, a true 
uh, objective third party's inability to perform. And on the laundry list that he sort of rattled out of, of, uh, of uh, uh, third parties that, are, that have had either the inability to perform or issues or delays with the performance, uh, there's, there's a host of them. And then the last thing I, I would probably add, and, and I would imagine Damien would agree with me, is you, know, you can still just use an amend extend when it's appropriate. In other words, just because this, this addendum exists doesn't mean it, it's meant to be comprehensive and to comprehensively push dates and deadlines back in sort of one fell swoop. But to the extent that you have uh, just individual or specific deadlines, the amend extend is still a very powerful document. I, I, I would just caution that as you're uh, a broker getting into sort of writing more expansive clauses or trying to address a wider variety of uh, maybe more sensitive or, or critical issues, uh, you'd be very cautious in, in, in doing that. So uh, anyhow, Damien, any other thoughts on, on the addendum? Or I don't think so. I, don't, I mean, I, obviously I get a lot of questions. I sure like to know if brokers have some. I know we're going to do that probably at the end though. So. Yeah, I can see questions are kind of popping up. So if, if you're asking questions on chat, we're going to come back and we'll fire back all through here. So I'm going to move on to uh, the second topic here, which is the good faith topic. And um, this is, I feel like I've been, I talk a lot about good faith uh, and have for years, but I feel like I really have been talking about it as I see the call volume on the hotline and other inquiries I get from brokers related to uh you know, mediation requests, earnest money release, uh, termination, all of these issues. Um, I, I want to emphasize, and the reason I put this, this topic in here now, is that things are, this is a totally, they're, the black and white answers that I could normally give to good faith, bad faith questions, I feel like I'm telling people that, you know, many of those answers are out the window because it's such an incredibly unique time with, uh, with everybody's ability to perform, willingness to perform, and what good faith is, I, I, I've been jokingly telling people, we might actually have a good, a good answer to what good faith was with regard to contract termination, but it likely won't come for several years once we finally have this all litigated out and maybe a court of appeals or, or some other court is able to you know, write an opinion based on what was good faith in today's day and age. And so some of the areas that I'm, that I'm specifically focused on as I'm, as I'm having this discussion is, uh, you know, the, the, the phone call that says, Hey, the, the, uh, the we, listing broker calls and says that we just got a termination from the buyer. We're supposed to close in four or five days. Uh, the, the loan conditions deadline or, or uh, uh, loan review deadline uh, was passed and the buyer terminated based on, on uh, uh, COVID essentially they put other and maybe put COVID or something to that effect. And, and so my normal answer in that situation, whether it's COVID or whatever, it, you know, not in the COVID era would be, well, obviously the seller is going to be successful in retaining the earnest money. If it was a, a termination for some reason that wasn't, you know, a, a, there wasn't a valid contingency remaining, then, then of course the seller, uh, I mean, the, the contract controls and it's, it's a very easy, uh, you know, analysis because, um, because of concepts like good faith and, and, and also contractual contingencies. When a listing broker is calling and asking the hotline in the, in the COVID era of the same question, my answer is a lot less certain and, and adamant. And, and I, I try and impose on the listing broker the concept that we don't actually know. Now we can say what the contract says, but let's imagine that you know, the, the parties aren't able to successfully mediate, ultimately that answer is going to be up to a judge and depending on the amount of the earnest money in dispute at that point, because as we know, on a liquidated damages contract, that's the only thing in dispute is the, the earnest money. But depending on that amount, they're going to be in front of a, you know, small claims court judge, county judge, or district court judge for uh, a larger earnest money amount. And particularly among the maybe, uh, I'll say less sophisticated, uh, you know, judicial venues, there's, there are factors that are in play that may include a lot more empathy than uh, a strict legal or contractual analysis that you might find in, in some of the higher courts. And a lot of our earnest money disputes are in that, you know, $6,000, $7,000-ish range. And so, again, 
in a normal world, I say clear as day. And for you as a broker, I'm, I'm never implying that you should be instructing your seller to just sign an earnest money release because I, I still think that the seller has a very good shot potentially at keeping that earnest money. But the, the, the reality of it is the, the black and white lines that we can normally live under in a, in a contract dispute are not as black and white in, in this COVID era because there is so much more empathy. Uh, and I would imagine we will have more judicial empathy. Um, the same issues related to uh, a seller's not willingness or unwillingness to allow inspections or allow appraisers on the property. Um, the same issues with good faith and, and performance ability with regard to uh, an investment property where you've got a tenant in the property and the seller's not able to deliver possession because they can't remove, they couldn't remove a tenant. I mean, all of these, these, these uh, issues that normally would be pretty black and white in terms of damages or a, a buyer or seller's ability to recover against the other party are now in a much more gray area. And so I think your job as brokers is not necessarily, well, certainly not to give legal advice, and it's not necessarily to interpret your client's ability to succeed or not succeed in a dispute. Uh, but to make sure your client is aware and speaking with legal counsel because the, the gray areas are much broader than they ever have been. And that is specifically the case with regard to good faith. Damien, you want to chime in a little bit with thoughts there? No, I think you're right. I mean, and some of the legal concepts I, I fear coming out of this good faith argument with COVID-19 is if a title company can't close the transaction or if the, um, you know, they can't get a tax certificate or the recorder, clerk and recorder shut down or something like that could be a mutual mistake or some kind of um, some kind of legal term that just says that because it wasn't the fault of the party that we're going to deliver the earnest money back. So I agree entirely that, that the concept of good faith was was fairly straightforward for a while. But in this day and age, without having anything litigated, we have no idea what legal concepts are going to come out of this that in which, you know, some buyer is allowed to get their money back because of some complication with COVID-19 that made it so we couldn't perform. And, and that's, you know, that's why, you know, I talked about the COVID-19 addendum and I think we mentioned, we're going to talk about this later, Scott, but again, it's about, you guys got to work your butts off to get deals to closing. That's just what it amounts to. Yeah, now more than ever, and we are going to come back to that larger concept in uh, in in just a bit. But um, uh, perfect. Well, I um, I think I'll I'll leave that there, and Damien, I'm going to let you talk a little bit about some of the remote notary stuff, as as most of you guys probably at this point know, and certainly Liz um, was helpful with this. And Liz, obviously, I'm, I don't mean to. If you want to chime in, feel free anytime. Liz is a I want to say esteemed lawyer as well, but I'm not sure esteemed is the right word for lawyers, but. She is, she is a lawyer too, so uh, she just, she's more on the, on the government affairs lobby side and less on the document and transaction side. But Liz, chime in if you want on any of that stuff. But, uh, but based on, on uh, the, uh, the governor just last week uh, issued a, a, a directive to allow the Secretary of State in Colorado uh, remove the in-person requirement uh, for personal appearance when having documents notarized. And so... Uh, the Secretary of State promulgated their own rules very quickly regarding that. And so for the next 30 days, I think we're probably more about 22, 23 days at this point uh, remaining on that, but it could be extended. Uh, you no longer have to physically appear in front of a notary in order for a notary to perform their services. But Damien, I'll let you talk about the implications on transactions and kind of what you're seeing there. Sure. Uh, so I've got, so there's a couple, I'm not sure that, how do I say this? So first of all, I think that the, LTAC, CAR, um, the Bar Association, there was a uh, CMLA, there was a whole bunch of people that, that Liz can talk about that were involved in getting this passed. And I think the concept behind it, I think is fantastic. And I think it's great that those stakeholders were able to, to get together. And I know that Liz worked really, really hard on, on getting this stuff figured out for you guys to try and make things easier to close transactions. Some of the issues that I'm seeing with the transactions currently which I'm hoping will go away as time goes on. Um, but right now we're, we're seeing a, a multitude of different issues. Um, for instance, if an individual signs the documents remotely, then they have to email or fax them back to the notary who uh, is getting those, which could have complications for older people that may or may not have scanners or fax machines. And most of you guys don't have fax machines, but 
Um, so that could be a complication because they do have to have that back to the closer in order to perform the remote notary. Um, another one that I've seen is that the list of things that the remote notary is going to have to do in order to perform a remote notary. They have to ask certain questions. They have to record certain things. They have to get certain documents. There's going to be a huge learning curve on that as far as title companies working with notaries to make sure that they perfect what the rules require them to do to make sure that they can actually perform that remote notary. Uh, another issue I've seen is that it only applies to Colorado notaries notarizing documents within Colorado, which means that if it's somebody that got stuck out of town uh, during this COVID-19 crisis or is somewhere that is, isn't located within Colorado currently, then this remote notary doesn't apply to them, it doesn't work as far as, as, as our statutes go. There might be other statutes in other states that work, but, but ours don't. But by far the biggest issue that I'm seeing currently is that there are a lot of banks that just will not accept remote notary. And I don't know if that's based on the concerns about whether or not the governor had authority to issue this executive order or whether it's just a slow change for them because they're not used to working with remote notary uh, or their attorneys have to evaluate to make sure that the legal implications. But currently, this works great for cash transactions, but there are just so many lenders out there that have been resistant uh, to accepting a remote notary. And, and Scott, I know I've talked to people, I, I think you may have, have talked to people as well. So, I mean, maybe you could chime in on, on what you've heard as well. Yeah, well, it's, it's sim similar. I mean, primarily, I think the lenders are just hesitant to sort of dive right into, uh, I mean, well, the, the candid concern I, I think they have is their ability to resell a mortgage if, if it's been notarized remotely. And if there's an appetite among investors to accept that. Now, I, I, and Liz can probably say, but I think 20 some states in the country already have existing statute that provides for remote notarization. And I'll let her chime in on the fact that I think we were pretty darn close in our own state here uh, in this legislative session, but, um, and may still get there. But, uh, but so in, in a situation like this, where you have an executive order, as Damien mentioned, the, the concerns among uh, a, an investor in the secondary market that's actually buying these buckets of mortgages, uh, the, 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 the primary lender, the first lender wants to make sure that uh, particularly the larger ones want to make sure they can they can put them in a bucket that bucket is 100% marketable and they can they can sell that to an investor and so to the extent while remote notarization technology is not uh, unique uh, to to every state or at least 20 some of them actually currently have it uh, the questions related to its validity uh, the processing I know there's some back end administrative stuff and to comply with the Secretary of State's uh, current rules there's there's a uh, things that, that need to be done. And so some of it's just an implementation uh, issue right now. It would have been nice to have had, had this sort of ironed out in, in previous legislative sessions, but there's a lot of, as with all legislation, competing interests. And so, um, so yeah, it's, I, I think the biggest concern is that the lenders just not being willing to acknowledge or accept remote notarization, uh, at, at least a lot of the larger ones that I'm hearing about. So Liz, you want to jump in with anything on that? The only thing... I would say is that there are 23 states right now that have state laws. As Scott mentioned, we're in the process of passing ours, um, and we hope that we'll get back to that, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but our version of remote notary passed out of the state Senate unanimously, um, but you're seeing, as Damien and Scott are both alluding to, a lot of the providers of this technology and the folks that have to accept this technology having to catch up very, very quickly with rules that the Secretary of State promulgated over a weekend. So the implementation hurdles are and hiccups are what we're seeing really out there in the marketplace until we have some more certainty. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see where it goes. But here's, I mean, here's my uh, sort of practice, practical advice on this is if, if, you, if you've got a, a buyer who's, who's obtaining a loan particularly, and even if not, uh, if you've got a closing coming up where there's an expectation or an anticipation that there's going to be remote, remote notarization uh, services utilized, you got to be coordinating early with your title company, making sure they're, uh, you know, in the loop and on board with everything. But perhaps more importantly, in the case of a buyer having a loan with your buyer's MLO, uh, underwriter, whoever it may be, to make sure that that's all going to be 
uh, possible. The, the, just don't make an assumption at this point that, uh, that your you know, remote notary is just going to fly with, with everybody because it, it certainly is not uh, in this early implementation phase. And maybe over the next week or two, we'll see some of that more ironed out. But specifically right now, as you've got a, a closing coming up, if that's the expectation, make sure the buyer is checking with their lender. Any other last thoughts on notary from anybody? And if you guys have questions, hit them in the chat and we'll, we'll get to them as we go through. Okay, moving on to showings. This has been a, a fun topic. Uh, and I don't, you know, it's, well, first of all, let me, let me get rid of, let me take care of this right away. And I'm certain that the panelists would agree with me. Open houses, be done. All right, shut down the open houses. There's no need to be having open houses. I don't know that anybody is, uh, but I hear oftentimes showings and open houses sort of spoken about in the same breath. Uh, no way, shape or form, I think anybody from a risk management standpoint ought to be doing open houses. And so we'll stop with that piece, but on the showing piece, there's a, there's a big spectrum of things going on specifically related to uh, some of the shelter orders uh, that are in place related to public perception of kind of what you guys are doing, related to obviously the, the, the health and medical impact of what, what everybody's dealing with, uh, related to a whole variety of things. And so, I don't know, David, you wanna, you wanna talk a little bit and give some thoughts and then I'll kind of follow up with you? Yeah, I mean, I assume you're gonna get to what, what we've had come up last week, but I mean, my opinion, we have brokers need to be good citizens. And I, and I think that the perspective is, is guys, you, you got to remember that you are in a world where you have the privilege of continuing your business in some form or fashion, but the perception that you're getting from the public or from other people that are sitting at home while their jobs are either furloughed or they've been laid off, or they're wondering if they're going to have a job to come home to, or come back to after all this is over is that you guys are just kind of flying the rules and putting everybody at risk. So, so as far as showings are concerned, um, you know, before we get into to the other issue that I'll let Scott talk about, it's be good citizens. I mean, understand that people are, are fearful. People are not only fearful about getting the virus, but also fearful about what is going to happen with the economy. What's going to happen with their industry. Are they going to have jobs? And the more that you guys are out there kind of flaunting that you're still doing business as usual or, or flaunting that you're, you're uh, working on stuff, um, the more issues we're going to have as far as the public turning things in. Um, I know that there's been a rash of, of complaints to the uh, Real Estate Commission that is saying that brokers are in violation of the, uh, of the uh, stay-at-home order. And I'm not sure that that's necessarily true. I, I disagree with that, but it doesn't all the fact that, that that is the perception that we're seeing out there. Yeah, that's, that's a, a big piece of it and then the less tangible piece of it. So the thing that came up last week and I, and I got pounded, I think, and, and I know Damien did with his clients as well, uh, end of last week when there was a couple of news stories related to the Attorney General's office uh, here in Colorado sending a a letter to a, uh, a broker, a realtor, uh, that there had been a complaint filed and, and basically it was the equivalent of, I would say, a cease and desist order uh, from the AG's office directly to the individual realtor uh, saying, you know, you, we had a, a complaint or allegation that you had asked a resident to leave their home. Uh, I think it was for a pretty extended period of time, actually. Um, and, and so that you could conduct a showing of the premises. And so what the upshot of the letter was when we, when we got a copy of it is that it, it, it appears as if there's a little bit of uh, uncertainty with regard to how the attorney general's office is interpreting showings specifically uh, in the spectrum of critical businesses that are authorized by the governor's order. So what the governor's order uh, exempting real estate essentially says is professional service, including real estate transactions. And so real estate transactions, uh, I have seen different attorneys and others uh, read that narrow, na more narrowly and, and, and others read it more broadly. Um, in the case of the AG's office and their, their messaging in, in their cease and desist letter to the broker, I think they were reading it very, very narrowly. 
And they even delineated between uh, showings, which they described in the letter as marketing services uh, versus real estate transactions. Now, I, I think from my perspective, and, and we've inquired with the AG's office, and I'm, I'm expecting to hear back actually today uh, get, to get a little bit more clarity on this. And I, I just haven't had it yet before this webinar, but if I get it, we'll get you guys another update. But, um, but the AG's office, uh, if, if they're referring to marketing services as showings, and that's something different than a real estate transaction, that to my mind is just a very narrow interpretation. And so I would say, and, and I, I spoke with Damien about it and I, and I know he agrees, um, you know, a real estate, the, the, the concept of a real estate transaction really, I, I believe, commences with your engagement with your client through an exclusive right agreement or through a delivery of a brokerage disclosure document and creating a transaction brokerage relationship. And it continues through the spectrum of activities that you might, uh, might undertake through closing and possession of the property. And, and obviously showings are sort of a part of that. Um, the facts in this particular case, I think, were a little bit unique and unfortunately just probably a bad perspective and example from, for, the, for the AG to analyze is what might have been their first complaint on this issue. And, and it, it sounds like this was actually a tenant that was the resident of the property and the broker was the listing broker uh, listing the property on behalf of the, the property owner, landlord, and, and apparently, you know, was, uh, was pretty assertive in, in requesting that the tenant, you know, leave the premises for a period of time. And so those facts aren't great. And in a normal situation, obviously, the resident of the property is, is probably going to be the seller. And if they're still agreeing to allow and accept showings and so on and so forth, it's pretty unlikely they're going to run to the attorney general's office or division of real estate or any place else and complain. And so uh, that sort of gives me a little bit of hope that this is a bit of an isolated incident but it does go to the larger picture of what, you know, Damien had mentioned in terms of, you know, sort of professional responsibility. And, and, you know, if, if you're in that situation and you're listing an, an investor uh, owned property and you've got it, it's tenant occupied, you, you know, you, you really should absolutely not be forcing anybody to leave the premises. The, that leads to, to, to well, one other point I specifically want to make is there's some legitimate disagreement among uh, different people who have reviewed, considered the order with regard to how far the, the order extends. In, in other words, you as a, real, as a realtor providing professional services under the order certainly um, would be able to attend showings and to, to carry on uh, you know, much of your brokerage business. But there does get to be a bit more of, a, of, a, of uncertainty or a gray area, let's say that you're a listing broker and you schedule a showing and you're, you, you've now told your seller, essentially, they've got to leave their house. Well, does that seller who's left their house for the purposes of providing access to their home for a showing, are they exempt from as, as a critical business in that case? Similarly, a buyer who might be attending a showing, are they exempt? I think you make some arguments and, and I know Damien and I have talked about this and and there's this, this concept of traveling to engage a professional service contemplated within the order. Um, and so you can make some arguments there, but what, what I don't want uh, you guys doing, your realtors doing, is providing that advice. In other words, you're really, if you're interpreting for your buyer or your seller, their ability to move about and conduct whatever activities they need to conduct, if you're interpreting the order and, and sort of telling them that they can, I believe that's legal advice that you're providing them. And I'd be very, very cautious about doing it. The other piece of that that I get a lot uh, of is the other sort of tertiary businesses, uh, real estate photographers and, you know, moving companies and, and things like that. And once again, uh, those businesses need to be making their own independent analysis with regard to the applicability or to the to the to their their potential exemption under the stay at home order. The last thing I'm going to mention, and then I'll throw it back to see if uh, Damien or Liz have any follow up comments, is a lot of questions about what trumps what in terms of you know state versus local orders. And and I want you guys to be very clear on this. In fact, I had a a, a, a county sheriff reach out specifically 
to ask for uh, legal bites done on this and for some some clarity because it, it's we know this concept of supremacy and you know federal law essentially overrides state law which essentially overrides local law well that goes in in one direction but to the extent that a county or a city wants to have more restrictive shelter measures in place or uh, that, that, that a county or city specifically does not exempt from their order real estate uh, services or real estate transactions in the manner that the state does, then it, it, it's pretty clear that, that that county, as they're being more restrictive in their shelter orders, uh, overrides the state. So the state is a baseline and no county could remove that you know, no county could be less than the state shelter order. In other words, uh, you know, Denver city and county couldn't say, we're going to open up our restaurants and, and let everything kind of carry on business as usual. But to the extent that Denver wanted to say, we're going to lock down even further, we're going to limit your activities, you know, even more restrictively, then they have the ability to do that. And so uh, as you're considering where you fit in to uh, your, where your business fits into uh, to the shelter slash stay at home orders, uh, make sure you're considering what any local limitations you have uh, as well. So, Damien, I'll, I'll, any other thoughts? Yeah, I, of course I have more thoughts. Um, <laughs> give me an opportunity to talk. Of course I'm going to talk. Uh, so a couple things. Number one, what Scott's talking about there with the local can be stricter or more restrictive than the than the state. Um, I've already seen Eagle County has not called real estate essential. I don't know if they'll have success in changing that or not. Uh, Pitkin County, it wasn't essential. I think they may have changed that one uh, to make real estate essential. San Miguel County, it's not essential. And Gunnison County, it's not essential. So this is a real um, potential risk. So and it's hard for Scott, me, or anybody else to stay up with what each health department is doing and whether they change their orders or not. So if you're practicing in a certain place, make sure that you are, are keeping up to date with what that county um, health order says and whether or not it's being changed because it could impact you directly. Um, the other thing, and I know Scott's looking for some feedback from the Attorney General, and, and I'm, I'm optimistic that, that Scott and his team will, will get a good outcome from that, but I kind of want to, I kind of want to read the language that came out of the letter that is causing this problem, um, just because I think it's important for you guys to see where this interpretation is coming from, or where there's there are there are lawyers, there are people that are interpreting that you guys shouldn't even be showing property. And what it says is this: it says, importantly, second updated public health order 2024, which was issued pursuant to Executive Order D202017 does not define real estate marketing services such as showings and open houses to be critical services, a critical business or necessary activity that would be exempted from the order's requirements. And so if the attorney general is willing to back off that position or, or give some clarity that says that maybe that wasn't entirely what they meant based on the circumstances of this case, uh, then that's great. Um, however, the language is so specific about showings and open houses not being allowed that you know, if you're out there showing buyers and sellers or showing buyers or telling sellers to leave or doing inspections or any of this other stuff, you, you've really got to be careful. And as Scott said, how far does that extend? Does that mean photographers are allowed? Does that mean inspectors are allowed? Does that mean appraisers? And, and it's really kind of open. Um, hopefully we'll get some more guidance and clarification from the attorney general, because in my opinion, that clearly is not what the um, governor intended when he put in that critical services include real estate because I don't know how you have real estate transactions without having showings. Um, but just to reiterate what Scott said also is that you guys should not be doing traditional open houses. That is, that is asking for people to complain, be upset, um, put people at risk. It's just, it's possibly the worst thing you could be doing right now. So that's yeah. all I got. Okay. Perfect. Well, I, uh, uh, I'm going to move on and let Liz kind of go through some of her slides, which uh, I think are going to be very interesting and a great update for you guys. So Liz, take it away. All right. Um, so we're going to transition a little bit out of practical and back to what the General Assembly is doing, and then we'll touch on a little bit of the federal stuff. Um, first, um, on March 30th, 
that was the last time the legislature met in person and they did a small procedural maneuver and did not hold a quorum, which took them to April 2nd. The reason they took that procedural uh, process step was to wait for the Colorado Supreme Court to issue their opinion. For those of you that have been tracking our updates, one of the things the legislature did before they took a temporary adjournment was ask the Colorado Supreme Court for guidance on how to come back because the last thing they would want to do is when they return to session, have anything they pass be challenged for constitutionality. So that opinion is out and back. Um, it's a fascinating read. If you have an extra 61 pages, you aren't already reading. Um, but to sort of distill it down for those that don't appreciate legal opinions as much as maybe Scott, Damien, and I, uh, the legislature is allowed to reconvene and come back and take off uh, where they left off. They have about 51 days left in the session. Um, there are a couple of caveats to that. Uh, as you can imagine, our economy is drastically different and our budget is drastically different than it was when uh, before the legislature took their break. So we don't anticipate that the legislature will come back until late May, maybe early June. And that's really because they're trying to wait for some of this uh, COVID emergency costs to become more apparent. The last forecast we had was a March forecast and it downgraded the December forecast from about 830 million in um, surplus to about 27 million. Our state budget's about 36 billion and most of that is funding that cannot, it, it's not discretionary funding. So essentially what happens is the state legislature will pass a budget and then any bill that's left after the budget has whatever money is left over. Well, when they got that March forecast, they essentially found out that they have to make 800 million in cuts to the state budget. So when the legislators come back and they're required to balance the budget, it's going to be a very difficult task. So they're going to delay coming back as late as possible. So we don't know yet, the, le the legislative leadership will determine, but we anticipate late May, early June. And you can go to the next slide whoever has control of it. Do I have control? No, I do. Okay. Um, so when they come back, uh, they will be doing mission critical business. They have to pass that budget by July 1st. Um, what that means is any bill that has a fiscal note is at risk of falling off. And I know there are lots of legislators who are hoping to find creative ways to fund their idea by maybe pushing out a couple of years while well, the Joint Budget Committee is on to them and is a little skeptical of those types of maneuvers. But I do think you are going to see um, it become a little bit political in the sense that there are some big Democratic priorities. And I say Democratic because the Democrats control both the House and the Senate. So some of the things that will become very important in terms of conversation include the public option and the family medical leave. Obviously the um, connection to the emergency orders that the governor has issued to allow those extra costs for insurance are um, critically important. I think you're also gonna see a lot of businesses and employers be um, watching that very closely because everyone's budgets are tighter and everyone's trying to cover payroll and cover their employees. So if there are further mandates that come back in the form of the policy idea, I think it'll be a very big fight. Um, the other thing to keep in mind too is the governor in the last, he signed a couple of bills that got all the way through the process. And I'll talk about a couple of those, but one of the bills um, was an insurance bill that didn't ha wasn't on um, the CAR Legislative uh, Policy Committee's uh, list of bills they were reviewing, but important in the bill he signed was a signing statement. He's actually telling the legislature he doesn't want to see any more mandates on insurance companies. And it, it, it's, it's called a signing statement, but it basically kind of warns people that he might veto certain items that are costly. So what that means for our LPC is they're going to have to prioritize what do we have left in the legislative session 
that is really critical and important that we would like to press, get to the top of that agenda. So um, in terms of that LPC priority list, one of those things, as we talked about, is the remote notary bill. We would really like to see our state legislation get passed because one of the things that is current right now is that gap in the interstate uh, process if you have an out-of-state buyer or someone who's not in their home locality. So we know, and I'll talk about this in a, in a little bit, but the federal legislation on interstate remote notary has not passed yet. But some of that language um, could jeopardize a state that's in the process of trying to pass their remote notary bill. And so we think it's very, very important not knowing how many months this might take for us to get back to a normal real estate transaction schedule that our state be able to have in-state transactions and remote notaries. And we know the Secretary of State, since she can put out um, rules within a weekend, has the ability to do this. And we think this is really, really important. The other things that we're gonna be looking at is some of the landlord tenant bills may become more important just because of all of the tension around evictions and for uh, mortgage forbearance. So we don't know how those might change, um, but we're gonna be watching those very closely. Uh, we also will be watching um, the inclusionary zoning bill that would have dealt, that was just introduced. I don't think the LPC has even taken a position because we took that temporary pause. So one of the things we're going to be looking at is trying to make sure any bill that goes forward doesn't add additional restrictions on building because while construction is considered essential, the last thing we would want to do is continue to put barriers in their place because their time period is slowed down as well just because of supplies but labor and trying to space out their employees so that they have the ability to continue building but do it safely. So and then one bill that has passed that the LPC that the governor signed that the LPC did look at was um, sealed evictions. It's House Bill 1009 and that bill um, would essentially say your eviction does not become public until you actually have an outcome from the court. So I think that'll be very interesting to watch in our um, new environment. Also, the other bill that passed that the governor has signed is House Bill 1093. And that is that gives counties a short-term rental licensing ability. So it doesn't mean they can change the property tax. Carr was very... Um, protective in making sure that we did not allow them that capacity. What it does do is give them an ability to license what cities and municipalities already have. So to give you an example, a practical example, if you're up in Summit County and you put your trash out, um, most of the trash receptacles have some sort of protection against bears getting into the trash can for obvious reasons. So a, a county authority would be able to regulate if you're in a short-term rental or renting out your property, you have to do certain things to protect it um, from bears getting into it. That's the kind of thing that 1093 would emphasize. And then the last thing on this slide, um, and happy to answer any questions about other legislation as we get to questions, but there is an open uh, conversation taking place right now around statewide ballot initiatives. So, here, um, as you can imagine, no one is outside, so it's very hard for a petition gatherer to get a signature to get something on the ballot, even if they do it safely and have a, a box of 100 pens and hand out one individually. Um, but what we're watching is some of the court decisions that came down. There are a couple of ballot initiatives that are in process, and I know there's an article out in the Colorado Sun today as well, they are asking the courts for extra time to gather signatures. And one initiative, I think 122, not any of the initiatives we've been working on, has already received an extra 15 days. We anticipate that anyone that is mid-process might also get those extensions. We're also hearing that the Secretary of State is interested in looking at e-signature gathering requirements. However, we're happy to report back that the governor and the state legislative leadership and the legislature in general is very um, against going to an e-signature type of process because of the data security around elections, whether you're a candidate or a ballot initiative. 
So we don't think that will go forward, but extending those timeframes for gathering signatures may go forward. So next slide there, Scott. Okay, so um, this is where we segue into our federal section here. And I wanna start out by saying I am not a employment expert or in any way a um, employee or employer benefits um, aficionado. So I highly recommend as your first course of action, if you're trying to answer questions, to start first with the NAR FAQs. There's some really good ones out on commercial, um, the SBA, and um, pandemic unemployment insurance. So I'm going to try to hit the high points and then we'll try to answer questions. So first, um, foreclosures and evictions, um, any federally backed loan, uh, you can request forbearance on mortgages for up to 360 days. So that's Fannie and Freddie, HUD, VA, USDA. If you have a private mortgage, then that is something you actually have to reach out to your lender and ask. Some of the private lenders are uh, following some of the federal guidelines but they do not have to, it's up to the individual lender. So ask your loan servicer, that's your first uh, option there. Um, also, if you are requesting forbearance, you are, it is connected to the eviction cycle. You are not allowed to evict or foreclose if there is a forbearance in place. Um, so there are a couple of different, de different dates in there. So what's important to know is to check in the dates and then know that NAR is working to get the dates matched up. And that may happen in the next piece of federal legislation. So if there's 120 days on the tenant eviction side, we would like to make sure, and NAR wants to make sure that the a forbearance on the mortgage side matches up because it makes sense that those should be equal. Um, the other thing is, uh, running through my, uh, my list here, um, 120 days of eviction moratoriums on fees. I would recommend just, um, and I, this is not legal advice in any way, but I would recommend your first course of action should be either talking to your loan servicer, if you are a property owner, or if you are a tenant talking to your landlord. There are a lot of business groups and a lot of companies out there really trying to work with people that should be your first option and best practices, trying to be as flexible as you can in this environment that is changing. Um, and then getting down to SBA loans and pandemic unemployment assistance. So if you are one of those properties who is not, has some tenants who are not paying rent because they're not able to during this emergency environment, one of your first recourses is applying for an economic injury uh, disaster loan. They are, um, some of the federal stimulus package passed several different things that are relevant to you. And the there are kind of three different things that apply to realtors. So first in the SBA category is that economic injury disaster loan and grant. They are applicable for sole proprietors and independent contractors and they will be, you have to show hardship and they are eligible to the end of December. And it's an up to $2 million loan or an emergency advance of up to $10,000 of forgivable debt. And that is supposed to cover rent or mortgage payments, um, costs of payroll, costs for supply chain disruptions and materials, any sick leave you have to offer to your employees, um, debt obligations due to lost revenue. So that's the first line, the SBA line. Um, and then there's payroll protection. It has the same eligibility. So um, organizations that are 500 or fewer employees, sole proprietors and independent contractors. So realtors are also eligible for these. And this period is shorter. So that's notable. You have to apply by June 30th for this payroll protection program. And it is based on last year's payroll, so 250% of the average salary expenditures. If you have any employees that make over 100,000, that's kind of the cap. So be aware of that. Um, the other thing to note is there's a couple of different deadlines in when you can apply. So 
As of Friday, April 3rd, small businesses and sole proprietors could apply for the payroll protection, but independent contractors cannot apply until April 10th. And you need to be in communication with your broker because if your broker is claiming you under uh, as the small business and sole proprietor, you as you shouldn't be double requesting if that makes sense. And then the last part is pandemic unemployment um, coverage. And so that is what NER has been working very, very hard for you all to ensure that we are covered. And I think here's where we probably have the least amount of clarity right now. So you are eligible to apply for unemployment if your employment has been reduced in any form due to the COVID um, maneuver and um, shelter in place orders and restrictions. However, right now it does say you're not eligible to apply for those if it's telework. And that's what NAR is trying to clarify right now. How does that match up if we're able to move around and do work remotely, can you also apply for unemployment? And I think the question is not yet determined. And what we're really watching is the State Department of Labor and Employment. So that's really what we're waiting on. While the Federal um, Labor Department has issued guidance, we still have to wait for the State Department of Employment to put out their guidance and when you can apply for those. So the biggest question, the biggest thing to note is stay tuned. We will update you as much as we can, um, but you can apply for both programs to SBA and payroll protection and unemployment. You can, you don't have to just choose one program. I'm going to stop there um, on all those federal programs. We can go to the next slide. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, to e echo, oh, I'm sorry. You've got one more slide here, don't you? Yeah. It's just a quick comment. This is what's still coming. They're working on one more federal package and that federal package is going to be taken up sometime between April 20th and April 30th when the Congress reconvenes or, so they're still working on that federal remote notary. They're working on some further protections for commercial property. And then as I mentioned, they're trying to tighten up the alignment. And um, the last thing, and I don't know if I covered this completely clearly the last slide, but just because real estate is declared essential services, it doesn't mean you can't file for unemployment and they're just trying to get additional clarity from the federal government. So that's what we're expecting. Perfect. Thank you, Liz. Um, yeah, we, you know, I, I've, I've been getting a lot of uh, inquiries from, from realtors around the state related to uh, filing for unemployment. And I, I think is, is it not even eligible until the 14th of April? Is that what I understand, Liz? That's the last guidance we heard. I think we'll be watching the state employment website every day to see when it gets updated. Yeah, so it's the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment is where they have a web page. You can Google and find it. And as of the last time I looked, which was admittedly, I guess, probably Friday, um, it basically said, you know, stay tuned when, it, when, you, when you got down to the filing uh, submission for uh, independent contractor filing for unemployment. And so, uh, you know, I think they're trying to put together w whatever administrative back end they need in order to accept unemployment filing. But ultimately, it, it is every state's Department of Labor that's processing uh, these unemployment claims directly through the state as they do all unemployment claims. So, and all right. Also local banks, too, that are providing the SBA loans. So that's important to keep in mind as well. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, and if you guys are having questions, just hit them up and we'll start firing away at those in just a second. I wanted to just kind of close uh, at least the PowerPoint section here with some positives, I hope. I don't know if it's, uh, well, the positives are, are hard to find, but, uh, but that is one thing that, that everybody needs to try and embrace to some degree. Uh, the, the, the takeaway that I want to I, I wanna give you guys is, is this. I talk a lot about value proposition for anybody who's seen like my 10 things class last year. One of the things that I spent more time than any of the other nine topics talking about was the NAR lawsuit, the antitrust lawsuit that came out it was actually last March, beginning of uh, March, 2019 was when that antitrust lawsuit was filed. And the, there's a DOJ investigation and there's, there's, there's a lot of challenges to our industry and, and, a, you know, various business models, 
um, a whole bunch of, of, of kind of assaults in some ways at, at, at our industries and how, how brokerage has been uh, from a, a traditional sort of uh, perspective as a, as a business model, a full service uh, business model. And, and what my teaching as, as part of, hey, listen, you have to be cognizant of not, not doing things that could be perceived as being uh, collusionary or antitrust or any of those things. But, but what, what I've been really trying to impose on you guys is your value proposition. And I've said it a thousand times to, to different people over the last year. And that is that th there's, I, I think there's three ways of looking at it. There's, there's brokers who have no value proposition, right? And they might well go away as, as the future of the brokerage things change, right? Because they just don't, they don't deliver a value proposition. And then there's, then there's the two other ones that, 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 I'd identify as those that have a value proposition and understand how to articulate their value proposition. And they're going to survive and thrive in any marketplace. And then there's those of you that have a value proposition, but aren't necessarily as comfortable or capable of articulating your value proposition. I believe every one of you has one. You wouldn't be sitting in on webinars like this uh, in, you know, for an hour and a half in the morning if you didn't have a value proposition. But trying to articulate a value proposition has been to trying to develop an articulated value proposition has been, can be a bit challenging, but this event that we're going through, I believe there is no better representation of a realtor's value proposition to a transaction than, than this right here. It's been handed to you in, in some ways on a silver platter. Your, your ability to, to think creatively, to work collaboratively, to identify problems that are coming up, uh, to add value to a transaction is greater now than I believe at any point in, in the past that I, that I remember. Um, and, uh, and if there is something to embrace and take away from all of this, it's your ability to, to sell that point, to articulate what you do, because there's so much of what you do on a normal transaction that goes unnoticed when you're doing it on a transaction right now. It, it is noticed. It needs to be noticed and it needs to be acknowledged not only by you, but also by your clients. And so use this time. If you have additional time to be thinking long-term because all of those challenges to our industry, those are, those are still out there as, as we're dealing with this pandemic. And they're going to be, be out there as we get to the other side of that. But again, the more you are capable of seizing on the value proposition that each of you offer and articulating maybe most importantly, that value proposition to your clients and your prospective clients, the better you will be set up, I think, long-term to survive and thrive. And so be thinking about that as you're working through this. I know it's a frustrating time, but at the same time, uh, you, you've never been more valuable to a real estate transaction than you are right now. So Damien, you want to jump in? And I know you've got a couple thoughts. Yeah, I, I mean, I want to point out the first thing on your slide, which is cooperation. Um, the value proposition really has to be about the cooperation in the transaction. As we talked about with the COVID-19 addendum, this is a fluid, fluid situation. And you guys have got to be working together to get things done. You gotta be advising your buyers about risks. You gotta be advising your sellers about risk. You gotta be helping them understand how they get to the other side of this. You gotta be counselor, you gotta be attorney, you gotta be um, everything in this transaction. I mean, this is, like Scott said, this is where, frankly, you guys are gonna shine. This is. You know, all the days of, oh, well, we just put a sign in the yard and, and we can sell our house and why do we need a real estate broker? And that's not the world we live in today. The world we live in today requires you guys to help it get to where it needs to be. And I just can't stress enough that you guys need to focus on, on helping each other, helping your clients, um, going through these transactions and figuring out how we get to the other side um, and helping everybody get there. So... Those are my yep. thoughts. Yep. Helping cooler heads pre uh, prevail uh, between the parties because everybody has got their own uncertainty and frustration and confusion. And, and you guys are right in the middle of, of brokering that. And so last two points on this is make you better brokers. This will make you a better broker. You will become, you will be a better real estate. You'll be a better realtor on the other side of this than you were going into it. Every single one of you, I don't care how experienced you are. You will be a better real estate broker when we're, when we're through with this. So, so do try and seize on that. The last thing, and this is a plug for Liz, you didn't bring it up already, so I'm glad I put it on there. The census, silly. 
Make sure you guys are taking the census. What was the last number you saw, Liz? 40 some percent? About 40 percent of Colorado, and it is so important. It determines if we get a ninth congressional seat. It determines what kind of money we get from HUD. It determines how we get money for education and transportation and schools, and it is very quick. It's less than 10 minutes. I highly encourage you to fill it out. Yes, please. We all do, and uh, and you you've got plenty of time. I mean, come on, guys. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here, and then I'm gonna flow through some questions, uh, and we'll just kind of fire these off as as we get down. I see a bunch of stuff uh, going on here. Uh, let's see. Am I going? I got 42 open questions. I guess they all are all here. Um, okay, uh, are you seeing realtors using these with builders right now? I'm assuming, uh, Heather, you're talking about the uh, COVID-19 addendum, and uh, it, are you seeing them use them with builders right now? I mean, I'll, I'll take care of that pretty quickly. Probably not as much. My guess is most builders are going to be, uh, well, first of all, the, the, the addendum specifically refers to, you know, contractual provisions that are in our contract to buy and sell, the commission approved one. So even to the extent that they were trying to use the theories behind the COVID addendum, um, they would not be using the addendum because it wouldn't have appropriate, you know, sort of cross references. Agreed, Damien? Agreed. All right, uh, let's see. So is it mandatory to use the COVID form for all transactions? Absolutely not. It, that's, that's kind of up to you or it's up to the parties really ultimately. Um, it just, hopefully it buys everybody a little bit of space and breathing room and kind of cools uh, cools things down and, and also, you know, does at a minimum account for the third party's ability uh, to, or the third party's inability to perform. Uh, if our county does not specifically deem real estate as essential services, are we, and we are continuing with limited services, existing contract closing, does this impact our E&O insurance liability, et cetera? Should our board be should our, our board be actively getting this change with the county? Damien, you want to give any thoughts? Well, I, I don't, I guess I hadn't thought about the E&O insurance. I guess the way I look at that is it's still real estate brokerage services. Um, I guess there is a question if you're doing something in violation of, a, of an order, you know, would the E&O carrier be able to deny coverage? I don't know. I honestly don't know. Um, I do think that even though we're not, in some of those counties that are not essential services, that doesn't mean you can't still work from home. You can't still um, try and do whatever you can. Uh, if you have a transaction that is done with the exception of closing, uh, then this is an opportunity for you to just, I mean, still close out the transaction. You just won't be able to, to be involved or be there at the closing table or whatever you want to call it because you're not essential. Um, I don't know. I mean, the E&O question is an interesting one, Scott. I, I would hope that they wouldn't be able to deny coverage, but I guess I don't really know. Yeah, I mean, this is another uh, kind of new frontier. It goes back to what, what we were talking about earlier. You know, sort of the traditional answers are sort of not the same anymore uh, or, or currently. And so ultimately we'll find out because somebody will probably file an e &O claim and insurance company will deny and maybe, uh, you know, they'll actually litigate it from an insurance uh, dispute whether it should have been covered or not. But it's not an answer we're going to get anytime soon. I, I would say this, and I'd be curious to hear Damien's thoughts about it as well, is um, let's, let's imagine that a, that a buyer uh, or that a, a buyer's agent takes a buyer to, you know, goes and looks at five properties this afternoon, uh, schedules showings at five different properties, and contaminates a home. And now we're talking about, you know, potential damages, a seller who now has to, you know, potentially move out for a period of time. They have to have, you know, sort of commercial or comprehensive cleaning, you know, decontamination, whatever else might occur. What are your thoughts with a scenario like that, Damon? Well, I, I, think, I think we've only seen the tip of the iceberg as far as what kind of claims could come out of COVID-19. I know there's, there's a bunch of form, forms floating around there. Of, I've seen in the industry of, um, oh, let's have a questionnaire that we ask buyers about whether or not they've been to Italy or whether or not they've been exposed to COVID-19 or, um, <laughs> or other questions about what happens if you have a buyer that does test positive after they went and looked at somebody's house or what happens if the sellers test positive after they had buyers go through their house. And, and I don't know where this comes out on the other side. I just don't know. 
what the standard of care is going to be or, or whether brokers will be liable because they should have done something else. Because at this point, we have zero guidance as to what exactly that's supposed to look like. Um, I know that I will tell you my opinion on the form that I've seen. I think it's mostly up in the northern part of the state with this questionnaire that has these questions about, hey, buyer, tell us some things about yourself. Like, have you been to Italy? And have you had an exposure to COVID-19? And are you feeling symptoms? And has anybody in your household had symptoms? And, and I'll tell you, my biggest concern about that form is that it's setting up a false sense of security for a seller that you get this form back that it means there isn't a risk. And I want to warn you guys that there is risk, period. I mean, the projections that they have on COVID-19 is that it'll end up infecting something like 50% of the population. And there's one in four people that are not showing symptoms, which is why they last week said, hey, everybody should be wearing masks when you're out in public. And so giving your sellers or your buyers a false sense of security that, oh, it's okay if we go in and there's gloves available and we wear a mask and we put on sanitizer that there's no risk, could be opening you up to a whole bunch of liability because I just don't, I'm not sure that's completely true. So that's, that's my concerns is that I just don't know what kind of liability is going to come out of this. Yeah. Again, normal world, you take sick buyers into a property and they get somebody sick, you know, you know, normal flu or other things, you know, it, there's no, there's no causation there. There's no, you know, it doesn't, it just doesn't translate. But in this case, this is so pervasive. And so, you know, there's so much information out there and it's such a, such a, common concern among people that, you know, that changes the analysis. So anyhow, uh, and I just want to clear up uh, on the last part of L Laura's question here. Um, I, I want to be clear, if your county, it, 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 let's see, the state, the state order would apply to your county if your county doesn't do anything to go beyond the state order. So don't take what I'm saying by the fact that if, if, if your state or if, if your county doesn't have its own jurisdictional limit, uh, or it doesn't have its own um, doesn't have its own shelter in place order that goes beyond what the state does. Then the state already applies. So real estate services in that specific county that doesn't address real estate services wouldn't it, it wouldn't be precluded in that county. So don't don't think that you've got to run out and get an exemption if your county doesn't already have an exemption. Does that make sense? Real real quick, Scott. I I believe Laura is in Eagle County and that's why she's asking the question. Oh, okay. Well, there you so, go. And I, I'm going to leave that up to the associations to decide whether they should be lobbying for this or not. It's, I mean, there's pluses and minuses to both of that. And, yeah. You know, I, I leave that to your guys' discretion. Yeah. Uh, tax certificate. Can you just download the info from the tax department on your County website to see if the taxes have been paid? Damien's shaking oh. his head and I would agree. What's that? I said, you're shaking your head and I would agree. Yeah, I mean, you gotta have the tax certificate from the county, that's the problem. And the, and the contract specifically says what that document looks like. Downloading something from public records is not the same thing. That's why I would suggest, Shirley, that you um, stretch out your deadline for your record title deadline, just to make sure that you give the title company enough time to get that document from the county and that your seller is compliant with the, with the contract. Yeah, billing in time is on new contracts or doing an amend extend to existing contracts to give people time. It doesn't have to necessarily be through the COVID addendum, but but just being being mindful of the delays with regard to uh, you know title companies that are short staffed and generating uh, all of the title commitments and tax certificates and uh, HOAs that are trying to generate or managers that are trying to generate uh, CIC documents. Time is 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 a is a nice luxury that. You know, again, if, if you're if you're really exercising those brokerage skills, uh, we'll hopefully get both the buyer and seller to agree to, to have a little bit more time. Uh, should we use an amend in conjunction with the COVID to make sure it, everyone is clear on dates? I, I will tell you my opinion on that is that I like, well, first of all, it, it's hard to do an amendment because I don't know what that amendment, how it plays with the COVID addendum would work. Because if you change it in the amendment, does that mean that now the COVID addendum applies to the new deadline and now there's another extension that could take place? So I think an amend extend is not the right tool. However, I think that uh, what Ryan's asking is a great question because I do think you want everybody to be clear, but I think clarity can come in the form of an email that says, hey, we've implemented 
um, the COVID-19 addendum. We now have a delay of X many days. Therefore, this deadline will now be on this date. This deadline will be on this date and make sure that it is clear. Uh, I think an amendment could muddy the waters though with figuring out, okay, so does that mean now we have another, other extensions and how does it work? Yeah, couldn't, I couldn't agree more with Damien. And uh, I mean, I, I say the same thing anytime you use a, two brokers are using a MEC dates in a contract or buyer and seller using MEC dates. For those two brokers, as soon as that contract's executed to get together and assign actual dates or to make sure everybody's expectations are lined up and there's not counting days wrong or confusion, same thing applies with this. If you're, if you're gonna use the COVID addendum and you're gonna bump the delay period out by 15 days, for the brokers to get together and make sure that everybody at the front end of that understands what those hard dates then become is critical. I, I don't think I'd do it through an amendment extend. I think I'd do it, or uh, I don't think I'd do it through an amendment extend. I think I'd do it through an email and, and other written correspondence. Uh, Damien, I got a question for you real quick. Have you ever seen Zach Galifianakis and uh, Between Two Firms? What, one more? Yes, I briefly, but. It looks like, like Between Two, two firms, firms right there. <laughs> Great. And Liz, I don't know if that's a compliment or insult. <laughs> I love that, Joe. It's hilarious. If you, if you guys haven't seen Between Two Firms, Google it. You've got plenty of time. Uh, <laughs> I have clients moving and relocating to cross country later in the first month of May. Have we heard any across state restrictions relative to moves or too soon to say, given our current stay at home order and inconsistencies in rules? It's a Seattle to steamboat move at this point. I am understanding that all moves are still considered essential. I, yeah, I mean, I, again, I think with all of my, my cautions, you guys would be very cautious about sort of providing your client with advice because I don't know what Washington State's limitations are. And, uh, you know, I, I guess in, in our case, if somebody was moving in, I'm not sure that move that the actual move is considered an essential or critical service. I've, I've, heard, I've heard that the uh, moving industry believes they fall under trucking so, oh. as far as critical business, but... Again, I mean, it's so fluid. Who knows what it'll be tomorrow? Um, you know, I think that's something that you got to warn people about the risk. Yeah. Uh, I hear a lot of buyers agents unwilling to show homes and understandably, but if we list a home, are we as the listing agent required to show that home to clients that are not ours if their agent is unable or unwilling to show it? <laughs> Cherry question, I guess. I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting question in light of everything. I mean, obviously, if, if we were in a normal world, I'd say, no, that's not your job. I mean, that's the buyer broker's job. I'm, I, I think this goes back to, I mean, brokers are going to have to make a decision as to what risk they're willing to accept as well. I mean, if a buyer agent isn't willing to show the home and the listing broker is, then, you know, I mean, that's fine. I, I can see where that you move forward. But I also see all sorts of fun coming out of this about procuring cause and do, are we entitled to commission and oh I did this job so I should get a referral fee and all, the, all these other messes that are going to come out of this. Um, I, I guess first of all you know if you're a listing broker showing buyers homes on behalf of other brokers then you're taking risk. I mean anytime that you are having contact with another person there's a chance that person could be infected and it could lead your lead to you being infected or your seller being infected. But um, you're going to have to decide what risks you're willing to take and, and whether you want to take, want to do that, whether you want to show it for your client or whether it's something you have to tell the buyer or broker, let's wait until the pandemic's over or find somebody else to show your client the property that you can work something out with. But that's just my two cents. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair response. I'll leave it there. Uh, why can't we get definitive show or don't show from state door, car, et cetera? <laughs> Uh, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to hopefully get a little bit more, like I say, guidance I expected from the AG's office today. I got an email actually since we've been on uh, saying that they're, they like to talk. So maybe I'll have an update for everybody later today. Um, I mean, the, again, the, the, the challenge is I, nobody here at CAR is going to say you, you can't show your properties. It's, it's not within our purview um, whether or not you're showing property. The, I believe that the state order contemplates real estate transactions and that within a real estate transaction is included the showing of a property. And, and that would have been my, my, my advice up and until Friday when the news broke and the AG's office was, was taking a more narrow view of that. Again, I, I'll have more information uh, at some point here today and I'll, I'll try and do a legal bias or some other update to this very quickly. Um, but 
those are your decisions. I mean, Dora is not, unless the state order tells you you can't do it, then Dora is not going to tell you you can't do it. And so, I, I mean, it's not, you're, you're looking to the wrong source for a, a definitive answer on whether or not you can show properties. If you're asking a, a nonprofit trade association like CAR, a state agency that is not going to interpret the governor's order for you. So I'll give you as much guidance and we'll continue to give you as much guidance as we can. But it's, it, you're, you're just not, we're not going to tell you you can't show properties because from, from at least my perspective, that is not consistent with what the governor's order or intention of the order is. Um, will you send us a recording of this? This will be recorded. Uh, this is all being recorded and, uh, and it'll be up YouTube. It takes a while to get it uploaded because of the size of the file when it's done, but either tonight or tomorrow morning, it'll be available for you guys to distribute to your friends and colleagues and other people who want to be bored to death. Uh, how would you recommend showing for rent vacant property to the public? Is it best to encourage the realtor owner to hold off marketing the property? Uh, Aaron, I think that's a fair question. I think it's showing uh, for rent property is the same probably answer as the showing is, is for sale property. The only critical nuance to that is if the for rent property is currently occupied by a tenant, their interest in providing access to their premises are not what a normal uh, uh, seller occupied property would be for obvious reasons. And I think it, it goes to the heart of probably the reason that complaint was filed with the AG's office against the broker. So if you're, if you're dealing with a, I mean, and I'm not even sure I'd be comfortable putting under contract right now if I was a seller as a landlord at tenant occupied property, if there was any expectation whatsoever that, the, that, the, that I was going to deliver the premises free and clear of the tenant. Because as we know, there's no real evictions taking place statewide. And if they are taking place in certain counties, then the sheriffs in those counties aren't enforcing the order that a judge would be giving anyhow. So a seller right now who is contemplating signing a contract, delivering possession of, of property to a buyer that is currently occupied by a tenant at any point over the next, I would say, I don't know, Damien, 90 days is probably entering into a contract that they can't for any, with any degree of certainty perform on. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, anyhow, very, uh, very cautious in that investment deal if there's a tenant occupied. Uh, deal is set to close. Buyers do buyers want to do final walkthrough. Okay to request buyers, broker, and buyers wear mask and gloves and limit time on the property. Sellers are 80 and 83 years of age right now and very nervous. I think that's totally reasonable. Gets back into this good faith. Sounds like Damien wants to say something, but I'll finish by saying this goes back to that good faith kind of concept that in a normal world, sellers have to provide access for the walkthrough. I mean, that's a pretty compelling set of circumstances. The sellers are 80 and 83 and they say, I don't want people on my premises, I, I don't know if they don't provide it, then the answer is going to be, I guess, what, a, up to a judge in a specific performance action or something silly? I mean, Damien? Yeah, I mean, that's what would happen is I guess it would go to a specific performance action. But I, again, this goes back to this false security. I mean, wearing gloves and masks doesn't mean that people aren't going to transmit the disease. I mean, there's, you can have it on doorknobs, you can have it on countertops, you can have it on tables and floors. I mean, it just, it, you know, this, we're, we're trying to pretend that masks and gloves are enough and sanitation stations are enough. And I, I'm just not sure it is. If I was, if I was representing that seller, I might suggest, I have an idea. Why don't we move out early? Why don't we find a place to go that you can go live now? And then maybe that's not a possibility. And that's why you're asking the question. But if we're on the final walkthrough and we're that close to closing, why not see if they can go live with some relatives or somebody else or, or get a hotel room that's clean or something that they aren't even going to take the chance that they have this exposure. I mean, it's still an exposure. Absolutely. Very, very fair answer. Uh, Jonathan, I'm, I'm hoping that this isn't going to cut off at noon. I don't know, but it's, it's 1155. I think Damien, are you good to continue answering questions and Liz? Sure. Okay. So hopefully we don't get cut off uh, at noon on this, if we do, then, uh, well, I guess we'll see on the, on the flip side. Uh, how will you inform us of the AG's response to your question in regards to the showings? Uh, we'll put something on the COVID portal. I'll maybe just, again, I did get an email here in the meantime, so I'll have an answer, I think, at some point pretty quick. I'll, I'll probably do a very quick legal bites maybe, and then we'll also maybe do a, a written statement or something on the COVID portal. If you guys haven't looked at CARS COVID portal, it's the main page of our website at this point, and you can't, can't miss it. So 
we're putting all of the information we get as we get it there as quickly as possible. Uh, so do check that out. Uh, are there any other complaints besides this one from, uh, from anyone about a real estate agents during, during this? I know Damien, you've got some, some data on that or thoughts. Yeah, on that? I, um, I've heard from, uh, sources of the real estate commission that they are constantly getting, getting, uh, complaints in. Now that's not, so the one that you saw with the lawyer, that was actually a complaint that went to the attorney general. That is a little different. And the attorney general is the one that responded to it, but the real estate commission has gotten complaints in which they claim that the, uh, that brokers are violating the stay at home order or, or doing something in regards to that. So it's, so there are other people and there's people watching you all the time. And if you're posting stuff on social media, bragging about the fact that you're open for business or that you're conducting business, there could be some re recourse for that. There could be some back, some back blow. Yeah. Whether it's neighbors that are seeing it and, and making complaints. I mean, it, 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 this just goes back to the fact that everybody is digesting this situation in different ways. And some people are, are very, uh, you know, very panicked about it and, and they don't believe that anybody should be out of their house whatsoever. So, um, what happens at the end of a lease if tenant doesn't move out and I want to put the house on the market? Well, normally in a normal non COVID world, I would say you get an eviction and you carry that out and you're probably looking at, I don't know, four to six weeks in order to carry out an eviction in, in probably most counties in the COVID world, I would say, uh, you're, you're probably out of luck unless you can work something out with the tenant to get them to voluntarily vacate the premises. And, and that is going to go, I think, well beyond even some of the maybe some of the limitations on shelter and shelter in place and other things i think at a minimum for some of this this tenant occupied stuff uh we're going to be 90 days maybe 120 days out before we start seeing any real punitive actions that the counties or sheriff's office are going to be willing to take uh with regard to tenants so and real quick on that even when they do re release and say that the evictions there's no more moratorium you can expect there's just going to be a backlog and a huge glut of these evictions that have to go through the system that even if they said tomorrow, hey, it's fine, you can start an eviction process, getting a court date might be almost impossible because you just the timing because everybody's, there's going to be a whole bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, I have two buyers coming in from out of town next two weeks. Their homes are sold in the States and they're coming, that they are coming from. Is that good enough reason to show with all the precautions? I mean, we've kind of talked about that to some degree, you know, the, Precautions are, you know, obviously at a minimum, you've got to be taking the precautions in terms of whether or not that is, you know, a critical business or essential. I'm, I'm going to leave that to you to, to analyze, Sonny. I know, uh, you know, you've got great perspective on, on so many things. And so if anybody can, can sort of analyze where that falls in the spectrum of critical, the only caveat I would give to that is if I end up talking to the uh, deputy attorney general at some point later today and, and they determine you know, that is absolutely our stance that this is a marketing service and it shouldn't be done, then I think everybody's perspective on the, on the essential nature of any showings at this point is going to change dramatically. So again, hang tight. I, I wish I had the response uh, before, but I will update everybody as soon as I can when we get off this call. And Jonathan, by the way, let us know that we've got until 1230. So we'll keep going here. Uh, Damien's going to send a bill to each of you for his uh, valuable <laughs> time. <laughs> I have a client who would like me to be present for all showings, this to be sure that they don't touch things and possibly spread the COVID-19. Seems like excessive exposure. Can we have some discussion on this and directive, please? Thank you. Damon, you want to hit that? Well, I, I, again, this goes back to you're the broker listing this property. If you have a client that is making unrealistic expectations of you to, to be in the house and expose yourself to every buyer that walks through the house, I guess you got to ask yourself if that's business you want to have. Um, I don't, I mean, if you're okay with going over there and meeting every buyer and taking a risk that one of them may have it and, and give it to you, then I guess you can certainly do that. But I, I mean, this is about, this is about broker health as well. This isn't just about buyers and sellers. And, and if you want to be out there taking the risk, then you're welcome to do so. But I'm not sure I would. Yeah, the only caveat I would have to that is if, if, if you're talking about a new listing agreement, so if you're entering into a new exclusive right to sell and you are going to agree affirmatively in that contract to actually attend all showings, then I think you've got a little bit different answer there. You've got to still decide if that's something you want to commit to, but I'm not sure where you are in your, in your document spectrum. You know, this is another example of, you know, non-COVID world, some of these... Uh-oh. 
thought you froze. Did I freeze? Yeah, okay. you're good you're now. Back. All right, in the, in the, in the non-COVID world, the answers might not be so clear in the, or the, in the, in the non-COVID world, the answers might be much more clear in terms of fiduciary obligations. In the, in the COVID world, you know, a little bit more tenuous to try and give you a black and white answer. Um, let's see, if a client is asked to schedule tours, are we uh, bound by fiduciary duty to comply even though uh, we are also bound to comply with the shelter at home? Same answer, I mean, this fiduciary concept that I just talked about, it, it, I mean, if you're, if you're committing in a listing agreement that you're getting ready to sign to, to do certain things, then that's maybe a different answer. But if you're just relying on the expectations of kind of the fiduciary and or uniform duties that are contained in the state form, uh, paragraphs five and six, then less certain answer, I think, than normal, normal world. Would you agree, Damien? Yeah, I agree. I, uh, I mean, fiduciary duties are fiduciary duties. And I think brokers need to be careful about what they promise in their listing contracts these days, because there's a lot of stuff that's going to be contrary to what you can and can't do. Yeah. Is there liability or risk to the broker if we're organizing and facilitating the photography, photography and or staging of the home? I touched on this a little bit during the, the program. This, you, I don't think you guys should be advising photographers or stagers as to whether or not they are compliant with the order or not. I, don't, I just don't know. I think they, if they're doing business, then they can either consult with their own attorneys or make their own determination with regard to the applicability of you know, the, the exception to the order. And I don't think it's appropriate for the broker to be analyzing that. Uh, if our buyer asks us if they are allowed to drive to look at houses and we can't give them a legal advice saying yes or no, how do you suggest that we address this with our client? Send them a copy of the order. I mean, Damien, I'll go ahead and let you, because I, I mentioned this during my portion. I know you and I have talked about this and I don't know, you know, there's the sort of travel exception in that order for getting to essential service providers. Go ahead. Well, there's, there's, a, there's something in the order that says there's critical, what's called critical travel. And critical travel says to and from um, critical business. So, I mean, I think you can make the argument that that fits in that place, but I think Scott raises a good point in the fact of, do you guys really want to advise your buyer that it's okay and then have them cited for $1,000 because they're out when they shouldn't be and then send you the bill? I mean, I would tell them that, you know, we're in a world that there aren't a lot of clear answers and I don't know if the answer is yes or no. We believe it to be yes, but you may want to talk to your own lawyer and decide whether it's a risk you want to take. Otherwise, if you're giving them definitive answers and they get pulled over and the police officer doesn't believe that it is uh, essential travel, or I'm sorry, critical travel or critical business, then you know, they might send you the, the fine and ask you to pay it. Yeah, and I think on that, on that point, I think Damien, I think the, the concept of a buyer going to a showing is more, to me, more tangible with regard to critical travel than a seller who's leaving their house and driving around in circles for a showing because they're not actually going to attend critical uh, business. And so all of this is just a, a bit gray. Just again, I would just be cautious and, and if anything, maybe this will help you delineate between what is critical and not, because if, if I'm a seller and I've got my house, or if I'm a buyer I've got, and I've got to find a house to buy because I have to close on my own house that I'm selling in 25 days, I might be willing to analyze more broadly that, that the uh, executive order to say, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do this and risk a thousand dollar fine. If I'm a looky-loo buyer who might just be out looking for deals in this marketplace because they feel like sellers might be distressed and I don't really have to be out, I might be, I would be a lot more conservative in my analysis of, of whether or not what I'm doing is critical. So, uh, okay. If a seller is allowing showings, can they put restriction on showings to not allow children in the home? The seller has children and doesn't want outside children touching their stuff. Oy. That sounds like fair housing to me, but I, why are they selling? I, I don't know. That's, what do you think, Scott? I mean, this to me is, is tough because now you got all sorts of laws that are, com <laughs> that are colliding. Yeah, no, I mean, I, that's a difficult one. I, I mean, and, and in a normal, normal non-COVID world, I'd say, yeah, you got fair housing issues. COVID world, maybe that becomes more reasonable to expect. Um, I think the, that seller might want to very strictly analyze if they don't want to just withdraw their property for the time being until they understand what the risks are. I mean, I get it. I'm, I keep telling my, my kids not to stop touching all my stuff and, and they, they don't seem to listen. So maybe, 
Let me know if you find an answer to that one, broker. Uh, should there be a statement made in the MLS to protect listing broker and seller? I'm not sure what the statement would say. I do. They want, they want to know if they should have a statement in the MLS that says something to the effect of that the buyer accepts all risks by going in the property or buyer broker accepts all risks. And I will tell you, I don't think those are effective at all. I don't think that they would stand up in court. I don't think they actually do anything. Um, so that's, that, I've seen that a couple times. And when I see those things, I just, it, I think, again, it's giving a false sense of security to a seller that somehow we've shifted the shifted the risk over to the buyer and the buyer broker because we put this magic language in the MLS and I just don't think it would hold up. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair, fair response. Uh, Mr. Matthew Loprino, my friend, has a question about he's going to be talking to CBS4 this afternoon. Uh, Matthew, why don't you call me directly? We can, I can give you, I, I, I want to not just try and force an answer onto this, uh, but I'm, I'm available if you want to give me a buzz, you know where to find me and Thanks for all the great work you do, by the way, Matthew, uh, with our, with our uh, media outreach and everything on behalf of CAR. Uh, the question I sent earlier is for showings with other buyers and their agents. I am the listing agent in this scenario. Seller wants me to hover over the buyers and the buyer's agents. Please advise. Thank you, Eric. I, I, Asked and answered. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we got to that. If not directly in your first question, Eric, then maybe through the rest of it. I mean, if, if that's what your sellers want and, and you're willing to do it, then... I suppose you can. I think if you agree to it contractually in the exclusive right agreement, maybe you have to at this point because that's your contractual obligation. And, um, you know, maybe your sellers want to consider withdrawing the property from the market for the next, you know, couple of weeks and uh, figuring out where we're at with uh, the spread of this thing. Um, if, well, what is our liability if we allow inspectors and appraisers to enter houses unassisted? Damien? I don't, I don't think anything's changed. I think you got to get permission from a seller. I mean, particularly, in fact, if anything, it's worse now. I mean, you have sellers, sellers that now are, could have an inspector going in that's sick or an appraiser going in that's sick, and you don't have a broker there. I mean, you got to get permission just like we did before. That's, that's why the listing contract was updated to ask if they were okay with those things. And to me, this hasn't changed. Yeah, that's a good point. The listing contract is, is updated as of January 1st of this year, and there's that whole section on who you're going to provide access to. So um, that dovetails nicely. Um, would vacant homes for showings be looked at different than occupied with a rule of no Apple overlapping appointments showing? Yeah, I mean, a vacant home, I think you can encourage everybody to lick countertops and, uh, you know, I mean, Andrew, I'm, I'm not, I am, I'm joking, but I'm not joking. I mean, I think, it, you know, there's a spectrum of risk that everybody has to analyze as you're in business. And, would a vacant property pose less risk? I could make an argument absolutely because you don't have full-time occupants of that property that may be exposing the property or may become exposed to the property because you've had a sequence of buyers through there. So in analyzing the spectrum of risk, I, I would say if I was a buyer's agent, I'd be a little bit more comfortable probably uh, showing a vacant uh, uninhabited property with being mindful of the fact that, you know, based on what everybody says about this virus, it can hang around on surfaces for multiple, at least hours, if not some cases days, I've heard all kinds of crazy stuff with that. And, you know, inherently a showing is a touch feel kind of thing. And so people are touching things. And so, but yeah, I mean, in my spectrum of risk, I would say vacant better than occupied. Wouldn't you agree, Damon? Absolutely. I mean, there's still risk of every other buyer that's been in that home, but at least it's, at least it's not the seller. On remote notary closing, should the realtor be present in the car, et cetera, when buyer closes in their own car? I, I don't, so the, I think the question here is, should the brokers be showing up to closing or, or, my suggestion is, is that for closings, brokers should be getting all the documents ahead of time. So you can review the closing statements, make sure everything's accurate so that you know what your buyers or sellers are signing when they, when they drive up to the title company. But as far as being there, I think in the world we're in, I don't think it's a necessary exposure if they took those other precautions. Good answer. Any word on delaying property tax deadline? I have not heard anything about that. Liz or Damien, Liz, that may be something that... Yes, so I know Denver has delayed theirs, um, and I know the governor has given some trustees some flexibility, but it is going to be county by county. Um, and I know for those that are thinking about the commercial property, that 
negotiation is ongoing. I know Katie Kruger, our um, CEO of the commercial, has been talking to several folks about that. The thing to keep in context is our property taxes also fund really important things like providing lunches to reduced um, income folks during this crisis. So it's a double-edged sword because your property taxes cover a lot of essential services for local governments. But we are hearing that there will, and, and we can track back and get you guys the executive order. It might be on the COVID-19 portal at CAR, but there are some relaxations to that. The question is going to be in the how, um, whether it's just waiving the interest on some of the property taxes and you still have the interest payment, or whether it's actually a later um, ability to make payment. Now, you'll never get out of completely paying property taxes. It's just a matter of kind of when that happens. But as far as I know, it's still county by county and municipality by municipality. Perfect. Thank you, Liz. Uh, what if the landlord holds an investment property via non-government backed loan and has requested a loan deferral and the tenants are not paying rent? Can you evict? You know, that's not, you probably, no, I would say, I mean, from my Is understanding that most counties in the state from a, on the, on the uh, county court side have said the judges will not be issuing eviction orders. Um, I don't know if that's a hundred percent, but I think almost a hundred percent or maybe a hundred percent on the county sheriff's side they have said we will not be carrying out eviction orders, even if you can get them. So I think a landlord that's trying to remove a tenant from a, a tenant occupied property right now, even if you're not getting the benefits of some of the federal incentives related to uh, federally insured mortgage loans, you're not going to have much luck getting your tenant out of the property. I will add one caveat that I understand that doesn't apply to commercial tenants that the, oh, yeah. none of this does, but absolutely. Yeah. And one other thing I would add to you is just as we've been talking, the um, governor has issued a fact sheet on eviction foreclosures and non-payment of utility bills that Dora just put out. So if you're on the Dora listserv, go look at that page. It's got a lot of really good information, including if you are a tenant and you are in, someone has actually tried to evict you, there's a number that you can call. So that is just another additional thing to keep in mind that when we're in this uncertain period, erring on the side of keeping people in their apartment and keeping people in their homes is going to be the focus of the government. So look at that. It's got a lot of good resources. Perfect. Uh, do we know if this applies to our owners of STR, short-term rentals, I'm assuming what that means. And I'm not sure what if this applies. I mean, we, I don't think we're talking about evictions with regard to short-term rentals. Um, so if you want to throw back another question that clarifies what, what you mean by if this applies to our owners of short-term rentals, uh, I think we can get to that, hopefully. Uh, I'm hearing that property managers are still delivering notices for demand, not eviction, but demand uh, for rent, and they are taking out the vacate wording from the demand notice. I guess they are doing it because some tenants are saying they don't have to pay rent, even though they can and still working, but they feel they do not have to pay rent because of wrong info being given out. What is your take on this, Damien? Will I, obviously, the the moratorium is on eviction. It's not on paying rent. So I think, and there, I heard there was this big movement, and in, in the commercial world, there's a big movement. I think like Subway and a couple other big commercial tenants started leading the way about they shouldn't have to pay rent in April. Um, and I think it's kind of gotten some some legs in the residential world. The reality is, is there's still going to be rent owed. And at the conclusion of this, there's still a possibility of an eviction. And so I guess if you're a property manager, you might want to be having that message with your tenants about, hey, I'm happy to work something out or maybe we can figure out what makes sense or doesn't make sense in the interest of not having to go through an eviction at the end of this. But yeah, they, they're still obligated to pay rent. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, so the other thing got, you can, one more oh, question, one more comment there, Scott. Um, the other thing you can point them to um, is going to the Department of Local Affairs. There is some assistance. The governor did use some federal disaster or, or state disaster money to help keep people in their homes. So one of the things you can point your tenants to is see if they can get funding from the Department of Local Affairs. Nice. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Sonny's got a question about S-Corps and SBA grants for unemployment work for S-Corps. 
I, it's pretty specific. Liz, do you have any thoughts quickly there or? Uh, in regards to the SBA loans? Yeah, for an S Corp. Any, I mean, is that kind of beyond our, our scope at this point? For the guidance from the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment, I, I don't think that S Corps are. So what NAR is currently working on getting 501c6s included, but S Corps, I think they're really defining it as independent contractors and um, sole proprietors. I don't know that they've gone so far to list out a certain type of entity in the federal legislation, but we'll look into that and see what we can find. That's Sunny. Yeah, you, you know where to find us, Sunny. If we can help with some additional information there, then. And then uh, Sunny also says that nail salons should be considered uh, essential. How do we get our nails done? I, I've been yeah. having some comments about my hair, and uh, I heard, you know, somebody made a funny joke that in, you know, just a few short weeks, we're going to realize what everybody's true hair color actually is. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thanks for that lightness. Uh, Chalice, if we, if and when we hear back from the AG's office, I, Carr will get something out on the portal today. Probably easiest for me to do a legal bites and maybe a quick little paragraph on what the upshot of that is. Um, so stay tuned and I, I will have something up, I think, today. Uh, Sonny, thank you. Thank you for attending. Uh, need clarification on qualifying for COVID economic injury disaster loan. Is that current or projected hardship? Liz, do you have any clarity there? Yeah, there was a question on this on the Hub over the weekend, and the answer that the NAR staff was giving was that you actually need to actually have the harm. You can't project out what you may have in a couple of months. Um, now, the other thing that they did tell that person on the Hub was you might want to apply now, and at least this is a response that another realtor gave, apply now and you may actually be able to def define exactly what your injury is later. So based on that, I would say we don't have a clear answer on that. We just have, um, but I do think to be safe rather than sorry, it'd be better to go ahead and apply. Um, the worst that can happen is that they will say we don't have your defined amount of injury but if you, the economic injury will be a set amount of money. So once it's out, it's gone. So I think you would be safer to apply, but we don't have the exact answer of how to do forecasted injury. Okay, so again, we're all responding to this, you know, Congress passed the CARES Act, you know, 10 days ago, I think it was signed into law by President Trump. And so, you know, we're all, Everybody's trying to get it on, stay on top of as much information as we can. So I'm sorry we can't give a little bit more clarity. I've got another question on the S Corp distinction. And again, I, I just don't, at this point, I don't think we have a, a, a very clear answer on that, but I might encourage you to monitor the NAR resources because they are uh, in front of this as much as anybody. Uh, should our offices be open with, with agents sitting around? Some of our agents insist on sitting in the office every day, not doing a critical function. Well. Uh, I think the answer would be uh, probably not if you're not, yeah, I, I, you know, again, I mean, it's, I don't know if that's part of a real estate transaction if they're sitting around the office, but um, anyhow, I, I don't know. That's, I would not be uh, myself, but uh, my friend Chris Hardy says a great way for brokers to reach out to their clients is to provide the census link. That's a great uh, point, Chris, is, you know, you guys that are sitting around thinking about ways to engage with uh past, current, future clients, you know, utilize your contacts. And I think that it would be uh, fantastic to, to reach out and send them a link and say, hey, you know, please do this and tell them all the great reasons they ought to be doing that. So good, uh, good information, Chris. Uh, as far as owners getting help with their more, oh, so Coral's back on the short-term rentals, uh, owners getting help with their mortgages for cancellations based on short-term rentals. Liz, any thoughts there? So it's probably going to be dependent on your um, software or um, company that you use. Um, if, for example, Airbnb basically said they would allow you to cancel any uh, property that you've reserved without penalty, but I don't know that that's the same across the entire provider world of those kinds of sharing technologies. So what I would do is check in with your exact company 
that you use. And if you do it on your own, then it'll probably track to the Federal CARES Act. But again, check your individual company. Yeah, and if you can if you can attribute it to the you know to the COVID in terms of the financial harm that you've undertaken, then I think that there's a there's a potential you could justify some sort of recovery. I'm just not sure exactly what program it would fall under. Um, let's see. I'm going to start moving here because we're going to get cut off in about eight minutes. Um, there's, address there's liability. Only left. In, what's that? There's only 59 left. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh no, that's not left. That's total. So. Um, oh, okay. We're, we're getting there close. Uh, liability as agents when inspectors, appraisers, et cetera, enter a home and ask us to stay outside. Well, I think that's reasonable. I mean, I don't think you have liability uh, for that. I mean, in, I, can't, I don't have time to get into the delineation between a licensed appraiser and an unlicensed inspector. And I know Liz would like a plug that maybe we get home inspector licensing at some point and that would maybe address all of this, but we can't seem to get that done for a variety of reasons. Uh, I think, you know, all bets are off in this COVID world in terms of liability for staying outside if they're asking you to. I Just be respectful and use your head. Uh, any updates on 1031 exchanges? Ulrich, uh, I'd say you ought to be up skiing right now, but uh, Steamboat's closed. So, uh, Liz, do you have any updates? Or Damon, do you have any updates on 1031s? I don't. Yes, I do. NAR has asked for extensions on 1031 deadlines and opportunity zone deadlines. Unfortunately, the, the federal agency who's in charge of making that determination is the IRS, and they're in the process of mailing out a lot of stimulus checks across America. So when they get finished with that, they'll start taking up some of those issues. But NAR has asked for den, uh, deadline extensions. Perfect. Fair response. Thank you. Uh, Sean Doherty, do you have any sort of suggestion as a number of days in the COVID addendum? Uh, Damien, you want to hit that? I, I Originally, I was saying 14 days. That seems to be the way I think it works best. Um, the first extension talks about shutdown extension, and I'd like to point out it does stack. And what I mean by that is if the title company has a problem, then you get 14 days for that. And then if the appraiser has a problem, get another 14 days. Um, that's the language that we've used in the addendum was the 14 because frankly, it was based on how long we thought this incubation period was for this disease. Um, but again, the COVID-19 addendum needs to be something that's negotiated. And I think that's a conversation to have with the buyers and sellers and figure out what kind of delay they think makes sense based on buyer's lock and how long um, they're going to be able to get a loan and um, based on when the seller has to move or, or any other set of circumstances. So I don't, I don't think there's really a set answer, but the guidelines I've, I've used is usually 14 days. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, if a buyer terminates at loan objection due to their down payment disappearing in the stock market fall, is that termination legitimate and in good faith? Any thoughts? I mean, what I would say, and then would, would it be set wise for sellers to tighten up the loan objection? I mean, even in a non-COVID world, paragraph 5.2 is pretty darn broad. And so to the extent that the financial condition of a buyer changes during the contract period, and they're still within that loan uh, loan condition or loan uh, review it's loan objection what is it it's loan review deadline. termination loan termination deadline loan termination deadline i thought it was loan review but anyhow as long as they're still as long as a buyer still has that contingency particularly in well in any even non-covid world it, it's a very broad paragraph that allows a buyer in good faith to analyze their financial condition and and as it relates to mortgage payments and everything else and so i would say it probably is and particularly in the covid world I think a, a buyer who has to go and get in front of a judge to get earnest money back is probably going to find a pretty empathetic year unless there's other facts that would indicate that, you know, they haven't been acting in good faith. So for landlords that hold their property free and clear and the tenant is not cooperating with the landlord with a rent payment plan, uh, land, can the landlord, this landlord can evict the tenant? Well, no, the same answer. I mean, it's, it's not a matter of whether you're allowed to or not. It's a matter of you, you couldn't, in most places, get in front of a judge to get a, a, an FED matter handed down. And then if, even if you got one, in, in most places, you can't get a county sheriff to go and actually perform the eviction right now. So uh, risks of agents talking about upcoming listings coming on the market when requirements lessen both within their office or on social media. You know, we're, we are going to see this confluence of coming soon or the uh, clear cooperation policy from NAR, and that's coming here uh, it has to be implemented by May 1. I have not heard about any delays there. And so I don't know if that's what you're referring to, 
but yeah, I think if clear cooperation policy is implemented uh, and, or in place, then I think the sort of talking to other agents or any public marketing as it's defined, you're going to have to uh, uh, be entering within one business day that listing into the MLS. So uh, hopefully that gives you some sense there. Um, as a sole proprietor, just watching my time here, we've got about three minutes. Uh, as a sole proprietor of an LLC, what forms of financial support are we eligible for? I can't do that question right now because it's too All much. All of them. <laughs> uh, what, what is the obligation to disclose to agents if there's a known COVID case in a building or in a multiple building complex, another building? Uh, Damien, hit on disclosure very quickly. I, how do you not? I'm going to tell you if, you, if somebody asks, disclose it. I mean, we're in a world that this is a big deal. I mean, don't you think a buyer might want to know if somebody had tested positive somewhere that could potentially infect them? I, I, I will never tell you not to disclose. Yeah, I would agree 100% with Damien. Disclosure is always going to be best, and who knows where the liability begins or ends if you don't. And so uh, error on the side of caution for everybody. Um, I'm going to, you know, guys, I'm going to cut it off there. I've got about a handful more questions. I'm just never going to get to them all. So I'm doing my best. The hotline is available this afternoon from one to four. Believe it or not, I am going to grab a quick bite to eat. I'll be covering it back at one o'clock this afternoon. So if you guys want to reach out to the hotline, I'm happy to try and answer specific questions. I will be updating everybody as soon as I uh, figure out the details from the AG's office. And uh, we'll do it via League of Bites and probably something else in the COVID portal. So do look for that. We'll push it out on the Facebook page. Uh, for Carr's Facebook page. And I want to thank very, very much my friend Damien, who is uh, fantastic and uh, so helpful in so many ways. Thank you, Damien. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I want to thank Liz, who is similarly fantastic and helpful in so many ways. And uh, thank you guys both for your time. I hope everybody found that valuable. We're going to try and do these every, I don't know, week or 10 days. And, uh, you know, for questions, like I say, the hotline's available. And hopefully you guys can utilize that resource. And uh, with that, I'm going to sign off and cut us off at two hours. This video will be uploaded, I think, maybe tonight, but probably tomorrow, just because of how long it takes to convert all this stuff uh, from a digital standpoint. So thank you guys again to my panelists. Thanks for Holly and Jonathan and Lisa uh, for doing the back end here. And uh, stay safe and healthy out there. Take care, guys. Bye.